Welcome to Novo Ed Talks, where we reveal real-world strategies and expert insights from learning and development professionals. In every episode, we chat with practitioners, course designers, learning strategists, and business leads. We hear about their experiences in the learning industry and predictions for the profession and the trends that they're seeing. But before we get started, a little bit about NovoEd. Founded at Stanford's Social Algorithms Lab in 2012, NovoEd is a people-centric, capability-building platform that combines social and collaborative learning to drive performance readiness at scale. Through cohort-based experiences centered around human interaction, NovoEd taps into collective wisdom, placing each learner at the center of perspective, application, and expertise. Large enterprises such as 3M, GE, Marriott International, and Nestle partner with NovoEd to accelerate their critical initiatives, reconnect teams, and achieve rapid alignment through learning that is felt, experienced, and swiftly transformed into impact. Now, let's meet our guest for today's episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the NovoEd Talks podcast, a space for training trailblazers to get real. My name is Melissa Fisk. I am the producer of the Novo Ed Talks podcast. And today I am joined by Terry Godfrey, who is the senior training developer at TC Energy. With over 30 plus years in training and development and an extensive background in instructional design and employee training, Terry's career has been marked by creating impactful learning programs that drive performance and compliance in the chemical distribution and natural gas industries. As part of a team of training developers at TC Energy, Terry's role has intertwined adult learning methodologies with industry-specific needs, leading to dynamic training solution and workforce development. Terry, welcome to the Novo Ed Talks podcast. Thank you for having me. So, Yes, we're excited to get into it. Why don't you start by just kind of introducing yourself, your role, and your company? Okay, like um, Melissa said, my name's Terry Godfrey work for TC Energy, which is a company that purchased uh, or, uh, yeah, purchased uh, a comp- another company I was working for about 10 years ago. So uh, uh, they integrated us into their uh, their fold, but I'm a part of a um, an organization within our company called the Training Center of Excellence, which was started last year. So as a part of that, I'm, I'm uh, one of the, the training developers. We have five. Uh, we also have a group of training strategists, and then we have a group of uh, systems analysts, which handle our uh, LMS, and we have a single manager over that whole group. So uh, that's been in uh, in operation probably for just a little bit over a year. So, Awesome. And tell us a little bit about TC Energy. TC Energy is a, a natural gas company, a, a fairly large company out of Calgary, Canada, that uh, has operations both in Canada, the U.S., and Mexico. Um, I, I'm predominantly on the on the east coast of the states, um, in in the area of the company that they uh, purchased about eight or nine years ago. So uh, we we not only deal with the natural gas. Up until recently, we dealt with liquids, uh, liquid natural gas, but they recently have sold that off, and it will be uh, that'll be finalized sometime in October. Um, if you're familiar with the XL pipeline that was coming out of Canada that uh, started up, was canceled, was started up and canceled, uh, that's who owns that. Uh, so that's the company there. Um, great company to work for. Uh, very, uh, uh, very rewarding uh, with their employees. Um uh, I like to I like to tell people that literally this is the best job and the best company that I've worked for in in my entire career, uh, which is uh, just very short around the corner. We'll probably be ending <laughs> so, in a couple of years, and so uh, but it's a great company to work for. So that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Um, why don't you talk a little bit about who your learners are and what some of their biggest challenges are? Yeah, the learners we have is 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 across the whole uh, industry, the whole company. It's not it's not only just the the technicians that are out in the field. It's also office personnel, 
It's the uh, C level, the C suite individuals up in Calgary and in our th three or four corporate offices that we have. So uh, it's very hard to kind of identify any one group. Uh, our developers, we uh, develop uh, training materials online. Uh, and more recently, within the last um, month or so, have started supporting also uh, um, instructor-led training, which is very minimum, but also presentations. Um, but um, I just finished up a course, and it's in review for um, behavioral interviewing. So I can go from that type of development to uh, technical development of a, of a module to how to operate a compressor station. So, uh, yeah, it's a variety, and it's fun to do. keeps you on your toes. So. Yeah, I bet. How do you kind of approach such a – vast audience of learners as you're dealing with all of these different types of folks like what do you find some of the biggest l d challenges to be to uh, reach the challenges, I, th I think um it, it's just um probably time i guess the availability um i mean there are some time zones that are involved here um you know calgary is like two hours behind us so there's some things of that nature um, I'm a big relational type individual, so I think it's very important to, to first build that relationship before you even start asking for help in certain areas. Uh, we do have a system in place, a, a workflow system that have uh, work plans to where uh, we utilize what are called business unit liaisons, and these are the individuals that are in contact with uh, our strategist, and that's where all of the requests for training and uh, that type of thing starts, and then eventually we get involved after the needs assessment and the analysis and audience analysis, and we get involved with determining is it really uh, that type of training that's needed. So we have a system in place, um, um, a little different than what uh, most of us are accustomed to in the past, uh, but it's it's still being fine-tuned. Um, and uh, seems to be working quite well. So That's awesome. You mentioned earlier that you do some online programs with, you know, the rise of remote work and virtual collaboration, especially in the past five years or so. How has your approach to learning and development adapted? Well, the, the, the thing with myself, uh, I've always been a learner and, and uh, we've had to adapt uh, from a standpoint of, of how technology is improving. Uh, the, the workforce personnel that we are bringing into our company these days, we still have that legacy group of individuals that are, that are with us that um, some have an interest in the technology, some don't. So we still have to take that into consideration when we build courses. But we also have that younger generation of technicians and personnel and workers and engineers and production specialists coming in that um, don't like being, you know, they, they do a lot of self-paced and self-directed learning. So we uh, we have to try to at least accommodate that uh, I, I think the technology side of it uh, from the role that I'm in is just, uh, I want to say, keeping up with it, which is no problem for me because, like I said, I've always been a a, a, a tremendous someone that wants to learn all the time. And then, like I said, the, the, the individual I, that I work with, he's he's on that. So he's a, he's a pretty nice, uh, good young mentor to me. So. Yeah, that's great. Um, it's good to have those. I feel like there's so much tech out there. It's tough to navigate it all and stay on top of it all and having someone yes. that you kind of like bounce ideas or or even just like new things off of is always super helpful. Um, how does your team identify and address skills gaps within your organization? Yeah, that, that's a that's kind of a toughie. Um, I, I think it's more in terms of um, on an as need basis. I mean, we we have a system in place when new employees come in, but once they get in, I think it's more in line with uh, just refresher training. So we try to stay ahead of any gaps um, with with refresher training being a highly regulated and a high highly compliance driven. Uh, industry, um, you know, we're, we're constantly 
um, updating that based upon procedures and compliance and regulatory issues. Um, so we, uh, if we get involved with that, it will be because uh, I hate to say this more, more likely from an incident standpoint, there through the investigation, they will determine uh, whether it was um, a skills gap or was it equipment. So at that point, uh, we may be involved with helping to develop remediation type materials for those individuals or even that particular group. So, yeah. Interesting. That's definitely something that like a lot of other industries probably don't face because they don't have yes. the, those strict compliance things that they have to adhere to. Um, how do you currently measure the effectiveness of your learning and training programs? And do you have any kind of core KPIs that you look at? This is always a tough question. Like, Yeah, it, is, it really that. is. Um, I, I would have to say that um, overall, we have not done and are not even currently doing a very good job in measuring the success of our learning programs. Um, a lot of the measurement that we have right now is, uh, is pretty much um, – uh, you know, butts in seat type <laughs> measurements, yeah. uh, courses taken, courses completed, that sort of thing. Now we are, uh, we do have a, a, a one person uh, individual in our group um, who is uh, involved with this. So we are pursuing an initiative to begin at least measuring um, has there been a change from taking this course and now back in the field um, putting it to work and, you know, has there been in, an enhancement in your skills? So we're, we're pursuing that and, and, uh, and putting together some, uh, uh, metrics to, to help measure. And myself, um, I'm involved with that because it's a, of interest to me. As far as KPIs, I think the big thing with, with industry is to stay in compliance. Uh, making sure that uh, all annual training is complete, <laughs> everybody is uh, qualified as it, you know, to, to operate the equipment and to perform the jobs that you're qualified to do. So those are the KPIs that we have to help this uh, individual training group, uh, which is uh, out of not necessarily in our group, to try to help maintain that as well. So. Yeah, absolutely. Those are, you know, kind of have to be your priority ones, yes, right? You have to. So. So, um, can you share a successful case study or example of an L&D initiative that you were part of that, you know, significantly impacted employee performance or that you felt like significantly proud of? Uh, a couple of years ago, actually, yeah, I think it was two years ago, uh, 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 FEMSA, which is uh, a regulatory agent agency that uh, monitors the natural gas company and that sort of thing came out with what they referred to as the mega rule. Now, as far as trying to explain what that involved, don't ask me because it, it, it has about eight to 10 components of it. Um, what was really interesting with that is, is everyone that I worked with, all of the subject matter experts, uh, were in uh, the U.S. and Canada. They were in like seven different locations. So they did have a project manager, uh, which was a blessing. So we put together a uh, an online course, which they went to a third party outside the company to see what the cost would be for them to build it. And when they came to us, they asked if we were capable of building it. And my manager said, yes, you know, we'll, let Terry, the benefit is I was familiar with a lot of the regs of my previous job as a trainer. So we were able to meet the deadline. There was um, um, the, the um, regulation went into effect a certain time. We had to have, it was a, a course, I think it was nine courses involved with this online. It probably hit a population of about 6,000 people. And we were able to meet that and uh, stay ahead of not being out of compliance when that went into effect. So that was a pretty good feeling to be able to be a part of that. So, Yeah, I bet. And to be able to move so swiftly and quickly to get that done. That's awesome. Yes. Um, you mentioned, obviously, you know, the online programs that you have. What role does technology play in your L&D programs? 
Yeah, it's it's beginning to put well, it, it's always played a role in this particular company, even from day one, especially with the remoteness, with um, us, you know, being in three countries. So the 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 majority of our training per se uh globally is is online. So that particular technology we have to stay up on and try to make sure that we're using the right software to produce um, you know, quality materials. But from a standpoint of, of uh, technology in the future, we're beginning to um, reach out and actually introduce the company to virtual reality um, on the computer. Uh, we um, are also experimenting with uh, creating um, virtual realities uh, uh, that can be uh, moved on to an Oculus headset to where individuals can actually visit a particular compressor station that may be over all the way across the country and actually feel as if they're standing in the in the compressor station. And so uh, it that's at the very um, onset of being introduced to the company. And the only thing that I'll have to say is myself and my coworker are the only two that are pushing that. We, we're introducing that to the company, and what we're seeing is just people are just uh, – some of the field people are just eating it up. So, um, But another thing is to, to publish it on a computer because everyone has access to their laptops, and so we've had some success with – uh, 360 degree images, uh, and, and enhancing some of our current regulatory training with, with that type of, um, training and, and, uh, interactivity and engagement with the lesson itself. So. Yeah, that's incredible. I, you know, I've heard a couple of folks on this podcast talk about like VR and the potential, especially for industries where I feel like you have to almost like do hands-on learning. You yes, can't yes. like without without actually being there or with the equipment mm -hmm. or things like that. And I do think there are some huge potentials for VR training. Yeah, we, we currently have a prototype that we share with uh, individuals that are interested of a, uh, a regulatory facility that's uh, on t literally on top of a mountain here in West Virginia, and it's uh, we we went up, spent uh, probably about half a day with a with a subject matter expert, and took uh, uh, not only the 360 degree uh, images, but also drone footage. We get to fly drones and take footage, and we're in integrating that into some of our training. But we've put together that. Uh, and you can actually visit that facility here in my office with a headset or on the computer. So it, you know, that, that's the fun part and that's what's keeping me here. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, and they allow us to do that. So uh, yeah. that, that's the, that's the great part. So that's so cool. I love that. Uh, thinking about just kind of the industry in general, um, you know, as L and D programs have rapidly evolved over the past five years and, Clearly, you know, speaking to what you were just talking about, how they're continuing to evolve, what are some key takeaways that you've seen um, from kind of these past five years of change? Yeah, I mean, I mean, well, one of the things that we've had to kind of work through is we've had to work through um, kind of an older generation of, of a workforce that um, were more hands-on and less computer, that sort of thing. So that that was something that we've had to work through. I don't know if that's answering the question in the right way, but that that was a really um, huge hurdle that we've had to work through, and um, and still have to work through it in certain situations. Um, fortunately, you know, we we've got people that that like to learn, but they choose to learn. Uh, if someone asks me, and, and I've had this uh, asked to me by managers in the company, even our L&D manager, is this a learning culture? And, and my answer to that would be no. Uh, and I, I say that from a standpoint is, is especially from a technical standpoint, we don't hire people to, to come and learn. We hire people because they learn and they come in and they have a skill and to, we call it move gas, but, um, you know, so you won't see me referring to our employees as learners. <laughs> so I'm one of the few. So, uh, so that's, uh, 
that's a that's a big thing. We're trying to introduce them to more of a learning culture, um, but um, they they're they're very self directed. A lot of the locations they work, uh, they're by themselves, and so um, you know to to be in a classroom like the old days, they they just don't really want that anymore, or even need it anymore. So. Yeah, I think that that's something, though, that is very actually relevant to a lot of industries. Um, Just what you're talking about is like trying to foster, foster, excuse me, foster that learning culture, because a lot of industries aren't, you know, sometimes as someone who does like sit on a computer all day, you know, it's that's something we take for granted, where it's like, well, we're kind of always just like learning new software in the flow of our work. And like, what absolutely. We, yes. And, and, and that's not the reality for right. a majority of people in a majority of in a bunch of different industries, too, not just yeah. in energy. You know, Yeah. speaking, of, you know, the industry I work in, I mean, our, our, our workers are technicians and, and that's predominantly who we really um, uh, supply a service to or myself anyway we have we have a couple of individuals out in Calgary that works really uh, large uh, you know and another thing that we deal with is is the language I mean we have down in Mexico we have Spanish and then um, unfortunately last year up in Canada their government came up and uh, uh, actually passed a law that any training that uh, was over in the Quebec area uh, had to be in French and we had to undertake uh, the translation of something like 190 some courses to be translated into French and so that that was pretty uh, I want to I won't even say it was pretty fun but it was uh, (laughs) it's uh, it's over so we're there and so anything that that we we produce now that's part of that workflow and that work plan uh, is it, is it going to be in a, a different language, you know, Spanish or French, that sort of thing. We didn't do a very good job up to that point because we would build a course in English, publish it. And the next thing you know is we need to have this in French. And so, you know, when you're designing the course and you probably already know this, I mean, there's there's things that you can and cannot do if you're going to have to convert it into a different language. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, Wow, that does not sound like a fun. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was um, uh, it was interesting. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, kind of like reflecting on the industry and thinking forward. Now, you know, you mentioned how you all are playing around with VR, but how do you see kind of the future of L and D evolving beyond that? And are there other technologies that you think are really kind of helping shape the way? Well, uh, I, I'm a uh, I have been experimenting in our company. We have uh, we have our own AI. I guess I think the AI in the industry in the, in the world actually is um, is taking off uh, tremendously. Um, and I'm not afraid of it. I guess being an old school type individual, I can see where it can actually be a tremendous assistant, not necessarily letting it to control me, but I can control it. Now, our company, um, you know, because of the the um, regulatory and confidentiality and that sort of thing, uh, we're not a you know we're not permitted to use Chat GPT 4.0, uh, but they created their own called Aiden, in which uh, you know uh, it it's doing a really good job in terms of as we you know feed it more information uh it's it's gathering and so eventually that will actually be um a part of a of of a system to where you can look up procedures it can reference uh particular procedures and work process flows and that sort of thing for individuals so we're experimenting with including some form of linkage in pretty much all of our courses that could end up linking to that particular AI um, in order it could be, a, you know, kind of an assistant for the person taking the course because, you know, the idea is to not, um, uh, you know, we want them to learn and we're, we, we, we don't want them to take a course and and feel as if they're going to fail the course. We want them to actually feel as if they passed the course. So, 
Um, but I think AI is is really shifting the learning and development. Uh, there was a time here probably three, four, five years ago that I thought about branching out into a freelance. But, um, you know, once I found out, of, you know, the benefits and the vacation time and all of that stuff that you don't get as a freelancer, <laughs> Uh, yeah. You know, I, I'm just staying where I'm at, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, apprehension on, on, on some people uh, that it's going to take everybody's job and, and, um, and, and it very well could do. I mean, I have no idea, but I think it's going to really move L and D. I think it already has to a degree with content development and uh, all kinds of stuff in that particular area. So. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, a, we get a lot of that on this podcast, opinions about that, where it's like, yes, AI, but like, I think people who are familiar with the technologies and how AI is really being used, it's like, it's not good. exactly what you said at the beginning of the question there, where it was just mm -hmm. that, you know, like, you can use it. It's not going to control you. It's going to be very beneficial for you, but it's not mm -hmm. going to like take over. Um so uh, I think that's something that most of our listeners can kind of agree with. Um, Terry, as our last question, um, as a fun kind of little send off, and you can expand upon this as much as you'd like or keep it short and sweet. We've had uh, folks do both. What advice would you give to those just stepping into a leadership role? Into a leadership role. The, the biggest thing I think is, is trust. I, I think, um, you know, the idea is when you hire someone, you hire them to do a particular um, role or fill a particular role or do a particular job. And, and if you're constantly having to micromanage them, more than likely you've hired the wrong individual. So I think trusting your employees and, and I've been very fortunate to have, um, uh, you know, managers over the course of my career to do just that. I've had some that's invested, uh, in me, um, quick story in 1995. So I don't know how you were there then, but in 1995, I had a manager lay these discs down on my desk, which was going to put us online for online training. And she said, put this, get this on the system. And I want to be doing safety training online next year. And so, uh, she was very instrumental in getting me started in the kind of online type learning and that sort of thing. But, um, but as far as a leader, um, just trust your employees, um, feel as if, um, you know, uh, as a guy, as a, another individual said, just leave them alone sometimes, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, so that's, that's the only thing I can say, uh, from a leadership standpoint, uh, you know, 30 some years and probably not being a manager, I've asked the question to my wife. I've mm -hmm. said, you know, am I not, you know, not getting a lot of offers to be a manager? Am I, am I not qualified and she said maybe that's not what you're supposed to be doing maybe you're supposed to be doing exactly what you're supposed to, what you're doing right now and i've come to realize that over the last 10 to 15 years of my career um, what i'm doing right now is i can do a better job of leading up um, than actually being in a in a position of management so uh, plus i get to have fun so i don't know <laughs> leaders do well lead there, there's a difference between leaders and managers so i think leaders do the right thing managers manage things right or do you know do things right so that's um so. i love that and i love it like the i think the idea of leading up is also incredibly important and there needs oh, yes. to be yes. that so yes. i love that and i think trust is obviously one of it's the best. huge. Yes, it's it's really, especially in our in our uh, organization, because like I said, our whole entire staff, that whole training center of excellence, is in Calgary, Canada. There's three of us here in the states. One, um, there's an analyst up in uh, northern northeastern PA, and then J my my coworker and I here in West Virginia, and everybody else is up there. So. Um, if there's no trust, I mean, it, it would be really miserable. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Terry, thank you so much for joining yeah. us today on the Noble Wood Talks podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Thank you so much. So, And thank you to our listeners for tuning in once again.